Good evening, uh, everybody. I just see uh, good numbers uh, coming in there from the participants. Um, good evening. My name is Danny McCoy. I am the president of the Statistical and Social Inquiry Society of Ireland. You're very welcome to our third ordinary meeting of what is the 174th session. Uh, tonight is the Barrington Lecture. Um, our recipient is Niall Farrell of Queen's University, Belfast. Uh, Niall will be the 131st uh, Barrington Lecturer uh, for the session 2020-21. So uh, looking forward to hearing Niall's uh, paper on uh, fuel poverty and how it's changed and the policy responses charting uh, fuel poverty, in particular in Ireland over the period uh, since 1987. Uh, the Society, as you know, for your first time, um, we normally take the minutes. And so I'm going to ask the Honorary Secretary, Dr. Ronald Lyons of Trinity College Dublin to uh, open the meeting with the Society's business. Over to you, Ronald. Thank you very much, um, Danny. So um, I have two um, bits of Society business. The first are the minutes, and the second is um, uh, an announcement of some rule changes. So uh, bear with me for that one. But on the minutes of the last ordinary meeting of the Society, which is the second ordinary meeting of the 174th session, of the Statistical and Social Inquiry Society of Ireland was held 4.30 on Thursday the 25th of November online due to the COVID-19 pandemic and associated restrictions on physical meetings. President Danny McCoy was in the chair for a symposium entitled Jurisprudence and its Impact Upon Public Policy. Presentations were given by Paul Gallagher, SC, Attorney General, Margaret Gray, SC, and Michael McDowell, SC. Following the discussion, which included contributions from Donald O'Brolcoin, Owen Flaherty, John Fanagan, and Paul Walsh, and responses from the authors, thanks to those who contributed and brought the meeting to a close. So that's the, the first element of society um, business. The second element is uh, according to the rules, uh, rather the laws of the society, uh, when we want to change those laws, we have to announce the new laws um, to, um, to two ordinary meetings in succession. Um, so if you'll bear with me, this will take probably about 60 seconds just to go through um, there are some housekeeping basics some tidying up of four of the society's rules. Um, uh, for those who are members, uh, the main change is just in relation to how council is elected. Um, uh, some of the other changes are, are smaller, but as I say, it will take me just um, about 60 seconds or so to go through the, the rules. So first, the, the proposed rule six and the full details will be on the CC website. Um, the, the, the proposed rule six is ordinary and group members shall pay a yearly subscription. The sum shall include subscription for the journal for the society. The subscription becomes due on the 1st of October in each year and is payable in advance. Ordinary members may compound for life their annual subscription by a single specified payment. No ordinary member shall be entitled to any of the privileges of the society or to vote at any meeting of the society when his or her subscription is unpaid. No subscription shall be payable by honorary members. Subscriptions shall be determined from time to time by council and any proposed alteration shall be ratified by a resolution passed at an ordinary meeting of the society. The proposed rule eight, eight members of the council, in addition to those who retire under law 10, shall retire each year and shall be eligible for re-election without nomination. The retiring members of the council shall be those who are most senior in membership of the council by reference to the latest date of election of each member of the council. In event of equal seniority, the member or members who shall retire shall be decided by agreement reflecting member participation or by lot. At an ordinary me meeting of the society normally to be held um, in the month of May each year, vacancies of the council shall be filled by election. Notice of such election shall be given by the honorary secretaries to each member of the society not less than 21 days before such meetings and none but members shall vote at such meetings. Any member wishing to nominate a candidate for election under this law who has previously obtained the consent of such person shall forward the name of the candidate to the honorary secretaries not less than 10 days preceding such meeting. That was by far the longest one. The last two are, are shorter. So the proposed rule 13, the council shall meet whenever summoned by the honorary secretaries of the society on the instructions of the president or on a requisition in writing signed by any three members of the council, five members shall form a quorum and the president shall have a casting vote. Procedure and at meetings of the council shall be determined by the council. And the last rule change, honest. Rule 18, proposed rule 18, the session shall commence in the month of September and close in the month of May. And if possible, at least seven ordinary meetings shall be held in each session. If convenient, the president or a vice president shall read an address at either the opening or closing meeting. 
So thanks for bearing with me. For those, I'll have to do it all again at the next meeting, um, uh, but I'll pass back to Danny there, um, uh, who'll introduce the lecture. Great, thanks very much, uh, Ronan. And as I said, it's, it's a great privilege tonight and a great tradition that we um, have the Barrington uh, medal winner, um, Niall Farrell on this occasion, you join a, uh, an illustrious group of uh, 170, 170 second anniversary actually of the lecture series. And this is from a trust that was put in place by John Barrington founded in 1836. So it's even older than the, uh, than the society. And this was to go around the country to uh, provide lectures on political economy because Barrington's concern was with poverty. Uh, but also with uh, workers uh, knowing how to negotiate uh, for their wages as well in terms of understanding political economy to try and keep the uh, industrial base at, such as it was in 1836, particularly in the south of Ireland, um, from not going under. So poverty was one of the topics that uh, John Barrington and the Trust was uh, very, con very concerned with. So it's, a, it's been a great tradition for the society to be associated with the Barrington, and there is a medal uh, again, we will present the medal to Niall, not tonight virtually, we'll, we'll organize um, a session to have a physical uh, celebration of handing that over. But without further ado, Niall, uh, hand over to you and congratulations on being the Barrington medal winner. Okay, Danny, well, thanks very much. Uh, a great privilege to be here and I'll just put my slides now and... Uh... Okay, so I presume everybody can hear me. And if, if I don't hear anything further, I presume everything's okay. So thanks again, Danny, for that introduction and Ronan. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. I'm delighted to be able to present this paper to you all. Uh, it's a bit disappointing, I suppose, given the circumstances, but that's, that's what we're faced with. But I can't be there to see you all today. But I, I can have a look at some of the names and it's great to see some colleagues uh, from Queens and from, from Dublin and uh, even further afield here today. So it's great to have you all with me to discuss fuel poverty in Ireland. Um, and for those from, the, from uh, colleagues at Queen's, unfortunately, this is focusing on the Republic. So it's very much uh, looking at uh, Irish data in terms of Republic of Ireland. So I suppose I should clarify that. Um, and uh, in the great, I suppose, many Barrington lectures which have looked at maybe data and some sort of economic or social outcome over an extended period, hopefully this will give some insight into fuel poverty throughout the last 30 years or so. In terms of a quick roadmap then, um, I'll set the scene in terms of what is fuel poverty. Some of you are probably familiar more than others as to what exactly that entails. I'll just give you a quick introduction in terms of the, the topics and what's important in terms of this presentation today. Then we'll go to the motivation data methods usual. I don't just want to present the data as a headline statistic. I want, I'd like to try and maybe give us some insight into some important questions and hopefully add in some way to um, the evidence base that's there for some policy relevant questions. And there's two parts I think that I found that could be potentially interesting. And one is there's an ongoing debate of whether fuel poverty in Ireland is distinct from general poverty. And if we can, what I hope to do is sort of break down the headline data and try and understand who is experiencing fuel poverty, how much is that perhaps those who have less lower incomes versus those who maybe are faced with uh, constraints in their dwelling and trying to see, can we feed into that debate in some way? And secondly, when we're measuring fuel poverty, can we say something about what sort of measurement would be perhaps uh, most appropriate? And I'll discuss a bit more about that in later. Finally, then I'll wrap up with some policy uh, discussions. Um, so what's the solution? I don't know if I'll have the solution, but hopefully I'll, able, I'll be able to color the debate. Okay, so first of all, what exactly is fuel poverty? Um, in terms of fuel poverty, the concept is much easier in theory than in practice. Um, the concept is basically the inability to afford adequate energy services in the home. And this is similar when it comes to maybe poverty, when we think about other types of poverty, maybe inability to afford adequate food or inability to afford uh, other elements of deprivation like um, clothing. However, it's not just the income effect, there's also an expenditure effect that, that's going on here. And if we think about that, maybe if I do a crude diagram, if you think about somebody who has average income, and this is perhaps their budget here, if I pick up my cursor here, I might be able to see this a bit better. So we have somebody on average income, 
This is perhaps their space, their budget. They have an energy expenditure and that's a certain proportion of their budget, quite simple to understand. If we have somebody on lower income, well then perhaps the energy expenditure takes up a greater proportion of their budget. And that's true for energy. If we hold energy constant, it's true for other necessary goods and services like say food. My food requirement is, is probably quite similar, my basic food requirement to my neighbor. But energy is a little bit different because the energy expenditure is not necessarily the same across all uh, households. Lower income households are perhaps more likely to have higher energy expenditures because they are more likely to have maybe uh, less or energy efficiency standards in their home. And therefore you're, they're being caught in both ends basically. They have lower income and then a higher expenditure. And this is the general uh, fuel poverty narrative that sort of takes place. And it's because of these two conflicting or well, two uh, effects that are in play that maybe policy tends to have a two-pronged approach. On the one hand, you want to try and access, address this lack of access to resources and perhaps help households who have lower incomes to try and maybe be better able to afford uh, adequate standards of, of heating in the home. But on the other hand, we have this sort of dwelling expenditure effect and um, policy may want to improve the housing stock to try and address that issue always also. So in that context, then fuel poverty tends to be taken out of maybe looking at traditional other aspects of poverty because we're concerned with maybe the, the housing stock, but also concerned with the ability of individuals to pay. So that's the basic, I suppose, foundation bit of understanding to try and think about well, what, what's going on here. Where does this paper fit in with that? Well, as the title would suggest we're looking at energy poverty over the last 30 years or so. We're trying to see what, uh, what, what the trend is. We want to see to what extent is this fuel poverty driven by access to resources versus the dwelling characteristics. What is the emphasis when it comes to maybe the problem? What is the emphasis when it comes to how policy should direct their resources in terms of addressing this problem? And secondly, can we say something about how we measure fuel po poverty, perhaps by calculating fuel poverty through a number of metrics and comparing uh, the coverage in both. So quick synopsis of this, um, of this issue, to what extent is fuel poverty distinct from general poverty? The narrative that we went through there earlier on is basically the basic fuel poverty narrative that we'd hear uh, in general. Um, and it suggests a complex interaction between income and housing conditions. A recent paper then by Dorothy and Bertrand in the ESRI suggests that fuel poverty is perhaps not necessarily a distinct type of de deprivation, but command over resources is the dominant driver when it comes to, uh, when it comes to what's determining uh, fuel poverty. So if we think about it in that framework of resources versus dwellings, well, perhaps instead of a two-pronged approach that's 50-50, or maybe, well, if, if in theory we could say it's 50-50, perhaps we might lean more towards helping those who have poor resources rather than the energy expenditure situation. That's probably what's, what, what uh, that paper would suggest would be um, more uh, a driving factor when it comes to the uh, fuel poverty issue, more command of resources as opposed to household determinants. So where can we feed into this? Well, if we look at fuel poverty from 1987 to 2015, and we look, at, we look at who is experiencing fuel poverty and break down the, those experiencing fuel, poor, uh, fuel poverty to uh, determinants based on dwelling versus inhabitant related determinants, try and understand uh, how this pattern has, has developed over the past few years, what are the main drivers and can we add some color to this argument? The very least, hopefully we can show the direction of travel in that context. The second thing that um, we want to sort of look at in this paper is how do we measure fuel poverty? Now, in, the concept is much easier than the application in practice when it comes to fuel poverty. Um, it's very easy to say that, to, to try and understand if somebody has, has it's difficult to, um, if they find it difficult to pay for basic energy in the home, how do we measure that? And there's a number of ways that have been used in the literature to date. There's expenditure-based metrics and subjective reporting metrics. Um, subject, subjective reporting metrics are essentially 
you carry out a survey, you go into a household, you ask somebody, do they find it difficult to keep their house warm? And then you can base your analysis off that. This perhaps has, has a lot of advantages. A lot of metrics would use expenditure-based metrics, and especially these are especially useful when perhaps you may not have a bespoke survey which would have such a question in place. This paper will focus on two of the most common expenditure-based metrics and maybe try and compare those two and to tell us um, what are the pros and cons of each, and maybe not necessarily tell us which is the best, but which might be the least worst in, in some certain applications when it comes to uh, energy poverty. So the two main expenditure-based metrics are the 10% income threshold approach by uh, Brenda Boardman et al. in 1991, and then the low income, high cost approach uh, developed in 2011, also known as the Hills approach. Essentially what's going on here, the 10% income threshold approach is very, very straightforward, has been the workhorse of energy poverty expenditure-based calculations for many years since 1991, and is still perhaps the go-to measure. It defines a household as being fuel poor if they are unable to obtain an adequate level of energy services, particularly warmed, for 10% of their income. Now, one thing to take into account here is that what's, what is ideally the application of this measure and what's done in practice. Ideally, it's a household that is unable to obtain an adequate level of energy services. So basically, what they would spend to obtain an adequate level of energy services. Often we would see in analysis, they would, it would be what's observed in the data. So basically what they actually spend. And this creates certain issues. So for example, it creates an issue that um, there might be people with high incomes and high costs. So for example, if I was Enya living in my castle in Kalini, I have a high income, but I also probably have a high cost. And by the Boardman approach, I probably are um, fuel poor. On the other hand, I might have a low income and a low cost because I'm looking at the, I'm trying to count my pennies and I say, you know what, I'm gonna to have to cut back on heating expenditure. And that means that the, I don't hit the 10% threshold. So in this paper, we, we use what's observed. So basically there is that potential for error, but I take it into account when I'm in the discussion and it's just something to bear in mind when we're looking at, at the data. The second issue is the low income, high cost approach. And this tries to essentially tries to weed out the ENIAs from our data set. We have two, tre with two thresholds. We have an income threshold and a high cost threshold. Essentially, you want to have your income below a poverty threshold, and then you have your cost above a high cost threshold. This is perhaps a little bit more complicated, but it, it might lead to a little bit less attenuation when it comes to the analysis. And that's something else we'll discuss later on. This is uh, also the approach that's used a lot in the UK nowadays when it comes to uh, the uh, calculating fuel poverty. Um, okay, so why is this relevant? Well, I suppose since the 2011 Warmer Home Scheme, uh, the 10% income threshold has been a core interim measure. It's been used in a lot of policy and papers in Ireland. A lot of papers have used this alongside other metrics to try and measure uh, energy uh, poverty. I just picked two more recent ones in an Irish context here that have used this alongside other metrics. But I suppose the key message here is that this 10% metric is quite often used. And however, there is an ongoing project to try and understand, well, what is the best measure? Can we find a more nuanced way to measure energy poverty in Ireland? Um, and it's been, it's been ongoing and measured in, and mentioned in a lot of literature uh, ongoing to date. So where would this paper fit in? Well. If there is a consideration for using expenditure-based metrics, well, at least some of the analysis here might help inform that decision. There might be a more nuanced approach, but if, if, if expenditure-based metrics are being considered, well, hopefully this will help inform that debate. Um, okay, so that's, that's what we want to do. Just to take stock for a second, fuel poverty, we have two aspects, dwelling characteristics, also income characteristics. We want to look at fuel poverty throughout the time period, maybe break it down and understand how people have experienced fuel poverty by their dwelling characteristics versus their income characteristics. Can we understand something about which is the predominant driver or help color that debate? And then can we say something about how it could be measured by expenditure-based metrics?
So how are we going to do that? Well, the data that we use is the Household Budget Survey. The Household Budget Survey, many people here on the list are probably familiar with it. For those of you who are not, it's essentially a snapshot of expenditure and incomes for uh, in Ireland for each year. And I'm using six waves from 87 to 2014, 2015. And basically it has a representative sample of households, all their expenditures, including energy expenditures, all their income data um, and other expenditures, such as, other data such as their socioeconomic profile. So a lot of information there where we can understand who is spending what and what sort of characteristics are associated with what sort of expenditures. Um, the procedure then is quite straightforward. Uh, for each wave of this survey, we have our list of households. And for each household, we know their disposable income and we know their expenditures on, uh, on uh, energy. And we can calculate the headline poverty rate. We can calculate each household there, whether they're in poverty or not, based on either the low income, high cost approach or the 10% threshold approach. And then we can calculate how many people in the population experience fuel poverty as a result of that. Um, and then we could break it down even further. We, that gives us just a general headline figure. And then we can understand, well, how does that break down by income decile? How does that break down by different types of dwelling, tenure types, et cetera? Indicators of dwelling, uh, dwelling, dwelling poverty. So that's sort of a more descriptive type analysis. And then the second type of analysis then is to understand, well, can we strip out maybe some confounding effects and understand, well, what is, associated with what variables are predicting fuel poverty. And we do that using a very simple logistic regression. Uh, if, fuel, if a house is in fuel poverty, it is determined by a lot of socioeconomic variables and variables which are associated with income, um, dwelling characteristics, and then also characteristics in terms of socioeconomic characteristics. And the final step then is to think about uh, fuel poverty in terms of different metrics. So the first step of the analysis, we'll use the 10% metric to try and break down what's driving fuel poverty. Then we'll compare the headline metrics between the 10% and the low income high cost to see where they're similar, see where they diverge and try and pick out if I was perhaps SAI and I was trying to identify, well, who do I want to give an energy efficiency upgrade. If I was to use one metric versus the other, who would I be including and who would I be leaving out? Why is this important? Well, I suppose an energy po fuel poverty metric, we want to be calculating those who are on low income. So ideally we want to be able to capture everybody who's on low income with high expenditure. Do we want to include those with low income and low expenditure? Um, I would suggest that they're perhaps people who are experiencing general poverty and therefore better targeted through general poverty-based um, policies as opposed to maybe uh, fuel poverty policies. But you know that's, that's something up for discussion, I suppose. I would argue that those that we don't want to include in fuel poverty uh, uh, policies are those who include, who incur high, who have high incomes because they are obviously able to afford uh, their expenditures. Okay, so that's basically it. All right, so that's what we're doing. That's how we're doing it. Now let's get to the meat of the analysis, fuel poverty throughout the last 30 years. And the first thing we want to do is look at, well, what is the headline fuel poverty uh, measure throughout this time period? Well, this is the general uh, calculation of fuel poverty. And I suppose there's a couple of things that I'd like to highlight. If I just get my cursor here, yep. So we see here there's a huge decline between 87 to 99, and then it tends to sort of bobble around between 10% and 15% of the population from then on. I had a look at the data as to what was driving uh, this 10%, and it seems to be a lot of people with higher incomes, perhaps, and also high, high fuel expenditures. And a lot of those were people who had uh, solid fuel, particularly coal expenditures. Now, I was trying to figure out if there's some change that happened around here, maybe, maybe not. Perhaps usage, perhaps policy change, something like that. That could have fed into this change, but 
it seems beyond that, field poverty tends to have a quite a, um, a similar uh, level. One thing to, to take into account as well, and I'll come back to this later, is that this, these are field poverty st statistics before I take away housing costs. And that adds on maybe another three or 4% to the metric. Um, and uh, something I'll come back to later. That's, that's, so, so, so people sometimes calculate field poverty by, this, by before or after uh, um, housing costs. And this is uh, perhaps a style or personal preference. And I, this calculation is before housing costs. Okay, so that's the general headline metric of what is fuel poverty. Now we want to maybe understand how is the fuel poor population looked and how has it changed? Has it changed? And the first thing we're looking at here is income decile. Remember, we're trying to figure out who's fuel poor and has this membership changed by, on the one hand, income related variables and on the other hand, uh, dwelling related variables. And the first one is income. So we'll see here, we have the same metric that we had before. We have our fuel um, poverty uh, percentage in the in population on this axis and then the years along here. And each, we break it down by income uh, decile. So one being the poorest decile and six, between six and 10 being the five most wealthy decile or ones with highest income. I think the key point here is that those that were squeezed out in the early uh, period of the analysis were those with higher incomes. Those with the high costs, perhaps, and the higher incomes that um, uh, were uh, reduced, that, that were squeezed out of the field poverty statistics. And then beyond that, field poverty tends to be comprised those with of lower incomes. So the key message here, I think, is that um, as one would expect, predominantly those with uh, in low incomes, very much so those in income deciles one to three, and very much perhaps an increasing range if we take into account this uh, high level of, uh, higher level of fuel poverty, maybe in the late 80s, early 90s. So we see it's concentrated amongst those with low incomes, um, as one would expect, and very much so those with, with the greatest degree of income, low income. To what extent do housing variables explain, or, or to what extent do those with who have poor income, poor dwelling characteristics, to what extent are they experiencing fuel poverty? Now, the first indicator, and one thing about um, the House of Budget Survey is there are a few indicators that we can take in terms of dwelling characteristics, but perhaps it wouldn't have the same sort of deprivation indicators that we would get from maybe the EU silk. So one that we can use is the year built. And as you can imagine, Older households would tend to have, uh, one would expect, would have um, poor energy, energy installation, insulation, other sort of energy efficiency standards, and therefore would perhaps be more inclined to experience fuel poverty. I took a lot of time to look through this data and to try and divvy it up and to, to, to look at it in very different ways. I could not find any clear pattern in terms of age when it comes to um, year built when it comes to its membership of those who are experiencing fuel poverty. It seems to be that even in 1987, if you had a 20 year old, if you had a house that was in, or you were looking at houses that were built in the last 20 years, they were as likely to be in fuel poverty as if you were looking at 20 houses built in the last 20 years in 2015. And that would suggest that perhaps dwelling age is not quite as much a driver of fuel poverty as perhaps uh, the income variables that we saw already. Another interesting one is in terms of tenure. Now this is quite an interesting uh, thing for a number of reasons. So first of all, a lot of fuel poverty literature would maybe look at tenure when you say, what proportion of those who are renting experience fuel poverty? And that's quite a large proportion relative to maybe owner occupiers. But if you look at the fuel poor population and you say what proportion of them are renters, well, it's much less than, say, those who are owner occupiers, which is quite an, in, well, it, it sort of makes sense, perhaps, is that there's more owner occupiers in the, in the population, but it's something that perhaps is not understood or not maybe presented as much in, uh, in the literature. And when we think about it in that context, we can see how the population has changed and where did that change has come from. And the majority of the change throughout this period will be amongst houses that are owned outright. So 
we can see here that those who are um, those who own outright, perhaps that's where the majority of the change is coming from uh, throughout the past few years. When it comes to those who are rental in rentals, uh, it seems to be quite a similar proportion of the total field property uh, going on the figures here. But perhaps it's a squeeze during the, um, the Celtic Tiger years, um, but uh, it seems to be uh, pretty much the same proportion uh, throughout. One interesting thing as well is that mortgage owners tend to be have a diminishing number diminishing relationship in the fuel poverty statistics or fuel poverty totals, perhaps reflective of the fact that, um, especially more in more recent years, those who are looking for a mortgage, perhaps you, there's a quite a high income threshold to get there and also quite a high, um, perhaps people tend to, when they're buying a new house, they tend to put in whatever upgrades are required or perhaps there are standards that, that ensure that, that happens. Another interesting one is the urban rural split, and this is a similar sort of uh, narrative, I suppose, to um, to uh, the the uh, tenure type narrative, um, where you might usually think about uh, fuel poverty in perhaps what proportion of urban households versus what proportion of rural households are fuel poverty, as opposed to thinking of what proportion of those in fuel poverty come from rural or urban households. Uh, so I just see there's a question there for William Scully. I don't know if you want to take questions between now or do you want to collect them towards the end? Um, My suggestion now would be that we we wait, we, we, we get all the questions and then you can take them at the end of your... your perfect. Time. Yeah, no worries. Um, okay, so what's, so essentially what's, what I would see is going on here is we see the decline, but there's a lot more movement perhaps in the urban um, in the urban population. And one, one comment that I would perhaps interpret, now this is open for interpretation, but my interpretation here is that there will perhaps be more income movement in the urban population than perhaps in the rural population. And perhaps maybe that would drive a lot of the changes in food poverty, maybe perhaps lend more um, weight towards the, uh, the, the argument that uh, income is uh, quite a strong driver of, of changes in fuel poverty, perhaps. If we think about that, well, if the rural population is sort of on a, rural population is on a, on a gradual decline, perhaps that reflects more, is more reflective of um, the, uh, the housing stock. So the reason why I would say this is because perhaps the urban areas are more exposed to maybe the economic cycle than the rural areas. And that would perhaps suggest that uh, we have more, perhaps give us more insight into maybe how the housing stock ha has progressed throughout the time period. It's just something that might be interesting uh, for, for, um, for policy. Now, this sort of descriptive statistics and interpretation of that is perhaps something that's interesting and perhaps somewhat speculative. An interesting thing is perhaps do the statistics uh, back up this speculation? Um, so I carry out some logit uh, regressions here, and basically trying to see can we can we move up, remove some uh, confounding factors and try to understand well is what we're saying actually driving what's going on. And the first thing I want to look at is the uh, regression in relation to something predicting fuel poverty and looking at uh, income deciles. So basically, this is uh, multivariate regression, and I've all the covariates in the regression, but I'm just pulling out the variables that are of interest for this, uh, this discussion. Now, we're looking at the, the odds ratio, the odds of being fuel poor based on uh, whether you're in a certain income decile. And uh, I suppose to interpret the odds ratio, uh, if we have an odds ratio of less than one, that means that exposure, such as a high income decile, is associated with a lower odds of being fuel poor. And these odds are lower, lower in 2015 than they are in 1987. So basically, the odds are less than one. That means that we have lower, it's a negative relationship and it's an even more negative relationship in 2015. So that backs up what we were saying in our descriptive statistics. The second thing we're thinking about is dwelling age. Does it actually have a significant effect? Well, the regression says it does. We don't have any uh, significance here in both time periods and essentially controlling for all the other factors, it would lend a suggestion that perhaps the dwelling age uh, has an insignificant effect. The next one is tenure. Now this is 
one that was quite, took me a long time to try and dig out, well, what's going on here with tenure? Um, and uh, there's a bit of a story behind this. So I, as I said already, I was looking at tenure and I was looking at fuel poverty before we consider housing costs. And when I ran the regression with fuel poverty before housing costs, where to be fuel poor, you had energy expenditure over your disposal income, and that was greater than 10%. I found, I, no matter how, what, what way I was cutting the regression, I was found, finding a positive association if you owned your house outright. Basically, those who owned their houses outright were more inclined to be in fuel poverty. Now, this was very counterintuitive, and I was convinced that there was a, there was a mistake or something going on here that I was making a mistake. And then one morning I woke up a bit like Paul McCartney woke up and got the uh, inspiration for the melody for yesterday. I woke up and got the inspiration for how to maybe address this problem. I calculated fuel poverty with after housing costs. So the disposing income, less housing costs, which is an alternative way to, to approach it. And I found a significant effect where those who owned outright were less inclined to be fuel poor relative to those in a, in uh, who had who were renting. So this is really interesting because it would suggest that when we bring in this income, this housing expenditure constraint, it's mo it's it's more it's associated with uh, fuel poverty associated with those who are in in housing in, in, in rental accommodation. Now, this is something that I really would like to dig into further, and I think it's probably worthy of a paper in itself. But perhaps it would suggest that it's more inclined if rental households experience a lot of fuel poverty, well, perhaps that's being driven by the financial costs associated with the rental, as opposed to perhaps the dwelling constraints, or at least we don't have any, if we don't have any, or any strong evidence in this analysis to say that it's from the dwelling constraints. So we have strong evidence that income is a primary growing driver, uh, indicators of dwelling vulnerability, um, dwelling age has an insignificant effect. Tenure is significant when we bring in resource constraints, that is your rental payments, your, your mortgage payments. And other effects that I didn't mention here is that the dwelling type has a significant effect. So basically, if you have an apartment, etc. So basically, if you're in a detached house that has a, that's associated with a greater incidence of fuel poverty. I didn't show the results because I'm not really sure if that really lends anything into maybe the, the income versus dwelling characteristics example, but it's, it's as one would expect. Okay, so that's the first bit of, uh, bit of analysis. Second, you want to look at the different expenditure-based metrics. Um, and we're looking at the headline statistics, first of all, when we're looking at the low-income, high-cost approach and the 10% income threshold approach. Now, we see here that the first striking thing here is that we have this 10% threshold uh, experiences that large decline in the 90s and eight, early, late 80s, early 90s, but we haven't seen that in this low income, high cost approach. And that's because this method is not as sensitive. This method is not as sensitive to those high people who are incurring high costs, those people who predominantly uh, had, had solid fuels. Um, so what, uh, what does this mean? Well, I suppose there's a few take home messages here. One thing I would say is that if you have a population that has a lot of high costs and, and also have high incomes for genuine reasons, perhaps, for example, it's just that they have to spend a lot on these, 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 in, these, uh, these costs. Um, perhaps you want to include them, perhaps you don't. If it's a case that they have um, quite, high, if, if it's a case that, 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 that they're more along the very wealthy end of the spectrum, well, perhaps then um, you, you might want to weed them out. So whether or not you want to weed them out, perhaps is to do with uh, the prevalence of these uh, households in your data. Another aspect as well is that these are predominantly urban dwellers as our previous uh, uh, analysis shown that the most movement came with, with urban, urban households. Another aspect then that was of interest is if we look at each household that is, that is experiencing fuel poverty and we plot it according to disposable income versus fuel expenditure, and try to get an understanding of where they lie on this spectrum. Now, here we have those who are fuel poor during the low income, high cost approach. Those are fuel poor due to the 10% approach. And those are who are not fuel poor. And perhaps just two, and we could see how this sort of pattern changes through the different waves of the, um, of the survey. Now, there's one or two things that I suppose I would just highlight. 
Number one, we see this, these people who have the high income, high costs, these tend to move out as the data moves on. Another thing we tend to see is a greater bunching among the low income. And that sort of corresponds to our decile type analysis that we had previously. It would paint a greater picture that we have a lot of people coming from low incomes that are, uh, the fuel poor population is perhaps greater, has a greater concentration among those with low incomes. Okay, so the last piece of uh, analysis then just to, uh, just, just to take into account is we want to see, perhaps compare these two expenditures. And what exactly we're doing here is that we're looking at, well, if we used the 10% approach versus the low income high cost approach, who would we capture and who would we miss? And we, the way I do that is I take the 10% approach and I look at everybody who's perhaps uh, captured by the 10% approach and see how they will be categorized according to the low income high cost approach. And then I look at who would not be caught by the low income high cost approach, or sorry, who would not be caught by the 10% approach would have been caught by the low income high cost approach. And then we can compare the coverage of each metric and perhaps give us some insight into which metric we would prefer if we were to maybe use it uh, to inform policy. So the first thing to see here is that this is our poverty line here. If you go along here, it's basically our 10% poverty line. And this is it broken down by the constituent components. So we see here, most of the people here are low income, high cost consumers. And that's probably people we would say unequivocally should be considered fuel poor. We then have those who are high income, high cost. These are the Enyas or people who are perhaps not necessarily of that really high income, but perhaps maybe higher income, but not necessarily considered poverty. And uh, which is a considerable proportion, but a greater proportion in the early, earlier uh, level. And then finally, we have these low income, low cost uh, people. And these are perhaps those who are um, not necessarily in fuel poverty, but perhaps in poverty more generally. And it could be argued that they were perhaps better addressed using a, a different poverty metric, different poverty uh, mechanism. This pink captured uh, element then are those who are in, I'll bring up my cursor, are those who are in fuel poverty according to the low income, high cost approach, but not according to the 10% metric. So what does this mean? Well, it means that in, on, in aggregate, towards the end, those who are captured by the, uh, those are captured by the 10% approach, but um, perhaps not in the low income high cost approach are, are canceled out by those who are missing. Um, if we're looking at the headline statistics so far, the two errors can't cancel each other out it doesn't really make much difference. The, where problems might arise is if you were to use it at an individual level, and then you are risking perhaps capturing a certain amount of people who have high income, high costs, and labeling them as fuel poor, as opposed to those who have a low income, high cost approach, um, who, because we're missing some who would have captured as poor in the low income, high cost approach. Um, okay, so that's pretty much that. So what's the solution? Um, well, if we're thinking about the solution, I suppose we have to first of all think about, well, what is the question? And one thing I'm always very conscious of when I think about fuel poverty and the debate around fuel poverty is, why are we concerned about um, fuel poverty? Why are we tackling fuel poverty? Are we tackling it because we're interested in energy efficiency for energy policy? Because we, want, we need to meet climate targets and therefore we need to improve the housing stock? Or are we interested in energy efficiency for social policy because there are people who are deprived and we need to help them out? If we're thinking about energy efficiency for energy policy, my argument would be, well, we need to get a certain amount of houses up to a certain standard, and we might as well target those who are less well off. We might have some additional social benefits as a result of that. In that context, well, then we need, to, we could take into account some of the, some of the analysis that was coming this, that we found in this paper. If we're using an expenditure metric and we use a 10% metric, we may capture a lot of people who have high income, high costs. However, if we use the model data, we might weed out some of our and some of perhaps those who um, 
have the high cost and not don't necessarily it's not necessarily their necessary expenditure. If we have a 10% metric, we might miss those who have low income and high cost also. So for example, as the previous uh, graph showed, there's a considerable proportion of those who would be categorized as low income, high cost, but according to the 10% metric, they are not uh, fuel poor. If we're thinking about energy efficiency for social policy, um, the paper by uh, Dorothy and Bertrand would suggest that uh, resources are of greater prominence. And some of the more descriptive analysis here, it's not quite as in-depth as maybe those papers, but it does lend greater weight to that argument that perhaps we have more of an influence from perhaps um, the uh, income-related access to, to resources-related argument versus the uh, dwelling-related arguments. Um, and therefore, and if that was to hold true, and that argument holds within policy, perhaps the weighting could be uh, more inclined towards the uh, income-related constraints rather than the dwelling-related constraints. One sort of key, I suppose, headline that a lot of people would suggest when it comes to uh, policy is that the nature of the support should be in accordance with the nature of the deprivation. And if this deprivation is more to do with resources, well, therefore, an appropriate res uh, response should be in more in, in, that, in that line. Okay, so to conclude, fuel poverty in Ireland has been addressed from 87 to 2015. We see that we have a greater emphasis on households that are more income constrained, especially uh, when we look at late 80s towards the present day. We have perhaps said that we compared our 10% metric to maybe the low income high cost approach. We have very similar results at a headline level. So basically, the headline statistic is pretty much the same, but when you drill down and you, if you wanted to use that data at an individual level, well, perhaps you want to be very careful about who you target and who you don't. <clears throat> so just getting hoarse as we come to the end. So thank you everybody for listening. Great, thanks very much, Niall. Um, that's a fascinating uh, exposition on, on the issues. Things very clear. Mm -hmm. um, so as you say, there are some questions coming in. I think maybe Sean, if you're still on there, would you like to come on the camera, Sean Lines, um, for your question? Sean, you're on mute there. If yeah. Hi, sorry, just figuring out my controls in this <laughs> platform. Hi, Niall, and, and thanks Hi, a lot Sean. for the really interesting paper. Um, a couple of points that, that I thought about as we went along. You know, you've, you've dug quite deep into the rich soil of the Household Budget Survey, um, but one of the things that really struck me is the extent to which we lack really good indicators of housing quality. So you took the usual one, uh, mm. housing age, and you had a few other characteristics like the type of dwelling. Um, but obviously, you know, you what you really wanted to be able to put in those analyses was something like house, household efficiency, which is measured for a lot of households, but it's not linked to conventional surveys. So I, I wondered what you thought about that. I know there hasn't been a, a, a housing condition survey of any scale since about 2001, but yeah. would that help kind of close off some of the questions that were left open for you? Absolutely. Um, very, very true. Um, so the, yeah, the, the indicators are very much imperfect that they're sort of, they're, if you ideally you would have something like, uh, you have something like, sorry, a lot of distractions here. I'm looking at, I should stop looking at the text. Uh, a lot of, um, so you have a lot of indicators. So it would be very interesting to get some sort of, uh, some sort of a grasp on what's driving that. And I think if you looked at, I think the, the Silk is probably a better data set for that. And one thing that is on my mind that was inspired by this work was to try and look at uh, maybe mediation effects. So basically, if we're looking at the relationship between household deprivation, maybe normal deprivation versus fuel poverty deprivation, does it go via, via income or does it go, via, go, does it go via other deprivation that we can measure maybe the Silk? And that might be one way to try and look at, get at that. So. I agree, it's, uh, it's very difficult. We're constrained with the data, but I suppose we need to have sort of clever ways to get around it. Ideally, we would have be able to link BER with household budget survey. That's, that would be the ideal, basically. Um, Great, thanks, Noel. Um, 
In the old world, you should never respond to anonymous letters, but we can respond to an anonymous attendee in this world. Um, if, if that attendee would like to come on, uh, it would be difficult for us to uh, find you perhaps, so I might just read the question. I see the cost of energy mentioned in the literature as a driver, um, example by the SRI. Did this factor, the, the cost of energy, uh, yeah. did this factor in your analysis, and if so, how, if not, why not? So I suppose the thing about it is it sort of comes out in the wash because I'm just looking at the expenditures and I'm looking at the income and it's the expenditure as a, as a proportion of income. The prices are in there somewhere, basically. So I don't have to actually deal with what the prices were at the time. One thing that I would be interested in digging deeper and looking at, well, what sort of price changes happened at those times? And did they explain some of this variation that was going on? And that's not something that, that I was able to, to dig out. Um, but I think it could be a very important driver. And definitely that would really, thinking about it now, that would be really interesting in the sense that if we're looking at income related and you know, dwell, you know how much resources you have versus the dwelling, if prices are a really strong driver, well, perhaps that would be more uh, along this, the lines of the, the income constraints. So definitely something that would be more important, perhaps not necessarily directly related to this analysis, but something that would be very useful in, and interesting in other analysis. Thanks, Noel. Um, Barra Rowntree, last year's Barrington uh, winner, has got a question. Barra. Getting Barra access there. Maybe. Yeah, hi, thanks, Danny, and uh, thanks very much, Noel, for a really great, interesting talk. So, uh, two questions, if I can be a little bit greedy, and maybe uh, one suggestion. Um, so you, you mentioned something about renters versus homeowners, and you can said that looked like there'd been a smaller number of renters in fuel poverty. But I was wondering, looking at that graph, is that true for the fuel poverty rate amongst uh, amongst renters even? That, that would be interesting to see that, and, and, and has that actually gone down? And also, relatedly, are they actually a large proportion of those in fuel poverty was the first question. Second one was just actually, in terms of, you mentioned you weren't looking at the silk kind of subjective type measure. And I was actually I was just looking there during your talk and it looks like it has a very different pattern in terms of like the, the as well as the levels, but the changes over time, it seems to rise and rise substantially over the, uh, the, the, the late 2000s and the recession uh, era and then kind of come back down. So it has quite a different pattern to what you can see in the expenditure measure. I just wonder, have you looked at, it, uh, at that and tried to reconcile why we see those very different you know, responses to essentially, or, or results, I suppose, for, you know, yeah. the portion you say they have that. And then, then the, 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 the last comment would be, it would be great to see that Hills type measure over time in terms of, I think there's a good case, as you kind of outlined, that it's in a way superior to the very basic measures that we maybe use officially okay. and are in need of updating. But what, what does that look like over time? You probably already got it. And, and it'd be really interesting to see what that actually, the, the poverty rate on that basis looks like. Yeah. So when you say the rate, do you mean the debt conditional of bringing fuel poverty or basically those who are in fuel poverty versus those who are not in fuel poverty who are renting? So if it's, if it's the latter, I didn't look at that, but um, that's probably what you're looking for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Uh, no, I haven't looked at that. Um, but I know I've, Said you, read your paper, and I've seen that you have. So uh, I know it's there. Not not over time. <laughs> not over time. No, not over time. That's true. Yeah, absolutely. So that would be interesting. Yeah, absolutely. That's a very good point. And maybe I will bring it into. Um, I will maybe bring it into uh, to look at that. The hills thing over time. I have looked at that. Uh, it's it's probably less volatile because of this high expenditure element. Um, and I was talking to colleagues at Oxford about this. I don't know if Sarah is here, Sarah Darby. And she was, she was very much proponent of the 10% the metric because it's a bit more, perhaps it helps us to identify those who are more, you know, more in depth and perhaps more, more uh, who are more, um, what's the word, uh, at, at higher risk of, of fuel poverty. So I suppose there are concentrations, but uh, uh, the Hills one is perhaps gets rid of this sort of volatility that we see in, in the first one. The um, subjective metric. Now, one thing is, I don't know how far you went back on the subjective, but in the late 2000s, there is a sort of a, a bump up a little bit. And it's sort of, so if you look at from, if you, if you cut the graph, basically, it sort of does maybe drive a little bit. I would be interesting to compare the two and to look at, delve, delve, delve into that a bit further. I haven't gone into the silk. Um, that's probably something to look at. I hope the next thing I want to look at is uh, using the silk, basically, and try and dig into that. So maybe I will dig into that. So thanks, Barra. That's very interesting.
I was muted. Um, so we've got a couple of questions coming in here. Um, Jerry Brady, Jerry, would you like to come on or Dorothy Watson? Jerry or Dorothy and Siobhan Carey as well. So just for me, if you want to give access to the guys. You can see those questions, I think, now. I think. Yeah, sorry, no. Just, people living yeah, at home. Uh, sure, I'm just uh, just some too much. Okay, Jerry Brady, uh, the amount of time spent in the home and the person's physical mobility are very important in terms of the impact of a cold house. I'm not. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you now, Jerry. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So we're doing a small amount of work in the CSO on it, and what we're hoping to do is develop a set of poverty fuel poverty indicators so we would take a broad approach hbs silk the bear data and we can connect the ber data with actual consumption the gas data the electricity data we published the report comparing the 2011 and 2016 census of population at household level and we examined the central heating fuel by different characteristics and the households that moved from solid fuel central heating were much more associated with a change in occupants so i think the an elderly person living alone they've got used to how they live if a new family move into it, you know, the skip appears, the builders appear, and you get a much more environment friendly type of heating. Um, the energy rating, if you have an FRG, you're going to keep losing the heat. So you're going to have to ha keep the heating on for much longer. Thank you. No uh, Thanks, Jerry. Great to hear that there's a, sounds like a very comprehensive uh, way of looking at it and a lot of comprehensive data being involved. So that's, that, that's great to hear there. Now I might bring in Siobhan Carey there as well, Siobhan. Uh, yeah, I can actually see the question I've written in. <laughs> um, but it was really about, you know, what factors the um, yeah, composition of the household brings yeah. to it. Exactly that, you know, welfare dependent, workless households, people who are at home all day, older people. And also around, I think I, you said you were using the 60% 60, 60 of the median income, That's, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So I think there's an interesting point around, um, particularly for older households, uh, where at that, at that cusp, you can get people just tipping over so they're outside of your your category um uh because of social welfare payments tend to keep up and keep okay. people just at that cusp so it might be interesting to look at elderly only households that are not in your income bracket yeah. but um, are just above it yeah that's really interesting so i have included in the paper there are in like back those sort of characteristics are included so basically people who have disability old age pensioners etc uh the results are pretty much as you would expect i didn't present them here because it didn't really fit into the narrative but um from memory as far as i know old age pensioners were it was associated with greater prevalence of fuel poverty um certain disabilities and incomes were had, had an effect all right um so there was aspects of uh, the, yeah, those sort of deprivations that were, were, were related to fuel poverty. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Siobhan. Dorothy Watson is on there as well, and uh, maybe you can let Dara McCoy in too. Uh, Dorothy, you first. Thanks, uh, Danny. Can you hear me all? Perfectly. Yes. Yeah, uh, my, my very well done, um, Niall. Very interesting paper, obviously an important topic. Um, could you say a little bit about how the profile of the people identified as fuel poor might differ between the different measures, um, apart from the obvious one of the 10%, sometimes including higher income groups? Sure. Um, no, thanks, Dorothy. And, thank, and I should take this opportunity to thank Dorothy for her comments on the paper as it went, because she was very helpful um, as somebody who knows a lot about this. So, 
has to be acknowledged. Um, in terms of the two uh, measures, does the, um, one thing, I, one thing that, that struck me as the, the primary difference is that because of this high cost threshold, we're weeding out a lot of people who have um, high incomes and high costs. And that's, that's, I think that, that's, that's a real advantage um, because we're, you might have people who have, who have um, middle income people who are spending a lot on, on their heating. And it could be a case that perhaps they're, it's something that they, they're doing it by choice. And, if we're using observed data, well, then we're picking up on that like we did in this paper. So that's something that one metric that I would prefer for the low income high cost. As mentioned already, the 10% metric is perhaps um, is perhaps a bit more simple and it can be easier to, to, to identify who are, who are perhaps uh, most at risk in, in some respects. Um, uh, Dara, Dara McCoy, would you like to come in? Sure. Um, uh, congrats, Niall, on, on the paper, and thanks for a great presentation. Um, so I'm interested in the, 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 the composition of fuel usage will have changed a lot over your sample period. So, you know, people, there would have been a significant move to gas consumption, mm -hmm. um, both over time and across space. And, and I guess, you know, there will be different issues in terms of measurement, you know, with metered energy consumption and also, you know, self-reported for, for solid fuel. And I'm just wondering, have you been able to decompose the composition of fuel poor by the primary means that they would have used to heat their home and how that varies over time? Yeah, um, that's a really good point. And it's something that perhaps is driving that initial shift because maybe the solid fuel could be an effect from back boilers going out of fashion around that time, something like that could be a play. I didn't get a chance to actually dig as deep into that as I would have liked. Hopefully I'll get around to that for the final uh, aspect of the paper. In terms of prices and stuff, um, that's sort of part of the expenditure. Uh, there was a bit of, I suppose, double checking to make sure everything was co consistent. Um, but definitely I think one nice interesting graph would be the makeup of fuel source uh, try, try the time period. That would actually help a lot, I think. So thank, thanks for that, Dara. Yeah, thanks very much, Dara. Um, I can't see any other hands up or questions there. So we might um, start to bring it to a conclusion. Uh, Niall, is there anything you'd like to do in sum up? Um, not a whole lot to say, just to say thanks very much, everybody. Thanks very much everybody, for the comments. and. For joining me here today uh it's strange feeling to get dressed up and not have to leave the house but uh hopefully uh, it's good to be with you virtually at the same time oh well congratulations and i said before we will uh we will do the physical presentation of the uh, metal you in good time and um at five past six you might even see a previous barrington medalist george lee doing his stuff on the six one news uh ronan is there anything that we need to in part for the next meeting date? No, we'll be in touch with um, uh, with everyone in due course. Uh, the next meeting is likely to be in uh, early March, but we'll we'll follow up on the mailing list in due course. Uh, if you're not on the mailing list and you'd like to join, um, uh, then just send an email to secretary at sissi.ie. So it's secretary at ssisi.ie, the initials of the uh, organ, uh, the um, organization, the society, and um, lastly, I have most of the comments and questions here, but I might follow up with a couple of people um, by email. So if, if you want to get ahead of me, uh, you can send through your your question or comment um, to secretary at um, uh, from today. But I'll, I'll follow up with those who contributed from the floor. I see I see one hand up actually. Um, Jared Kills his hand up. Yeah, Jared, you want to come in? That could if you could. Be Sometimes. Maybe Okay, well, so if, if you do, Jared, we can uh, follow those instructions and yeah, put in the question to Ronan. So listen, um, thanks everybody for joining us again. Congratulations to Niall, great paper and look forward to seeing you all at the next meeting. So good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you, everybody. All the best. Good night, everyone. Congrats, Niall.